Hi, my name is Elena Mazel, and I am the Executive Director of the Israel Law and Liberty Forum. I would like to warmly welcome nearly 500 people who are attending this event live. There's been a tremendous response to this timely topic, and we're very grateful that you are sharing your time with us and investing it in having the tools uh, to talk about a more accurate uh, perspective or more accurate discussion, richer discussion of international law and the war in Gaza. The issue of proportionality is one that you've no doubt heard and read about extensively in the past couple of months in the coverage of the war against Hamas. It's a principle that is often misunderstood and misapplied and uh, usually a key term weaponized against Israel and the West. Uh, it's especially misunderstood in the context of asymmetric warfare in which states are at war with non-state actors. And each of our speakers today is going to shed special light on the way that this idea is understood by the American military, the Israeli military, and the Jewish tradition. So uh, our first speaker will be Captain Thomas Wheatley, who is a U.S. Army Judge Advocate and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Law at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, New York. Um, then we will talk uh, with or hear from Lieutenant Colonel uh, in Reserves Maurice Hirsch, who is the Director of the Initiative for Palestinian Authority Accountability and Reform in the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and a Senior Legal Analyst at Human Rights Voices. He served for 19 years in the IDF Military Advocate General Corps. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from Rabbi Dr. Major Mitchell Rockland, who is the Director of classical Jewish Classical Education uh, uh, Concentration Track at the University of Dallas, and the Academic Director and Dean of the Lobel Center for Jewish Classical Education. He is also a chaplain in the Army National Guard with the rank of Major, uh, as well as the President of the Jewish Coalition uh, for Religious Liberty, a uh, member of the Rabbinical Council of America's Executive Committee and Military Chaplaincy Committee. Captain Wheatley, please begin. Thanks so much, Alana. Uh, well, first, let me offer my thanks to the Law and Liberty Forum and the Institute for Jewish Ethics for inviting me to offer a few remarks on this. I'm also grateful for my fellow panelists for lending their time and expertise to contribute to this very important discussion. And of course, um, thank you for the kind words of introduction. So as a small preliminary matter, I have to issue the standard disclaimer that comes with these sorts of things. Um, and that is that everything that I say in my personal, I'm saying in my personal capacity and not as an army officer or an agent of the United States government. Um, so therefore the views that I express are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the United States Military Academy, the United States Army, the Department of Defense or any of its components. So all the housekeeping matters aside, let's go ahead and dive in. So I've been asked to provide an American perspective on the principle of proportionality in the law of armed conflict, or as we call LOAC. You may also hear it referred to as international humanitarian law. So in doing so, the first thing we should note today is that we're talking about proportionality in the context of the law of armed conflict, LOAC. We are not talking about proportionality as a criterion for just war theory or use ad bellum. That's a totally separate body of law. Um, next, within the LOAC framework, under the American perspective, we know that the DOD treats the principle of proportionality as distinct from the rule of proportionality. Um, proportionality as a principle is broad. Um, as you perhaps might expect, it's more of a guide to assist in planning and executing military operations um, than a distinctive rule of law. In addition, it provides uh, the foundation for the specifics uh, the specific law of war rules that, that, um, to which our service members are held to account. Namely, and that's through three means, um, which the DOD Law of War Manual summarizes as, first, helping practitioners interpret and apply specific treaty or customary rules. Second, providing a general guide for conduct during war when no specific rules apply. And three, working as an interdependent and reinforcing parts of the coherent system. So as far as definitions go, the DOD's definition of the principle of Proportionality is pretty straightforward. It's, it is, quote, the principle that even where one is justified in acting, one must not act in a way that is unreasonable or excessive. So that's the foundational principle of proportionality. As to the specific rule the DOD has chosen to adopt and enforce to effectuate the principle of proportionality in the conduct of hostilities, things are a bit more black and white, but not much. Um, as we'll see, there remains plenty of room for disagreement. Um, a good place to start for understanding any rule, as any good lawyer knows, is the rules text. Um, for the deal. Captain Wheatley, please begin. 
Thanks so much, Alana. Uh, well, first, let me offer my thanks to the Law and Liberty Forum and the Institute for Jewish Ethics for inviting me to offer a few remarks on this. I'm also grateful for my fellow panelists for lending their time and expertise to contribute to this very important discussion. And of course, um, thank you for the kind words of introduction. So as a small preliminary matter, I have to issue the standard disclaimer that comes with these sorts of things. Um, and that is that everything that I say in my personal, I'm saying in my personal capacity and not as an army officer or an agent of the United States government. Um, so therefore the views that I express are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the United States Military Academy, the United States Army, the Department of Defense or any of its components. So all the housekeeping matters aside, let's go ahead and dive in. So I've been asked to provide an American perspective on the principle of proportionality in the law of armed conflict, or as we call LOAC. You may also hear it referred to as international humanitarian law. So in doing so, the first thing we should note today is that we're talking about proportionality in the context of the law of armed conflict, LOAC. We are not talking about proportionality as a criterion for just war theory or use at vellum. That's a totally separate body of law. Um, next, within the LOAC framework, under the American perspective, we know that the DOD treats the principle of proportionality as distinct from the rule of proportionality. Um, proportionality as a principle is broad. Um, as you perhaps might expect, it's more of a guide to assist in planning and executing military operations um, than a distinctive rule of law. In addition, it provides uh, the foundation for the specifics uh, the specific law of war rules that, that um, to which our service members are held to account, namely, and that's through three means, um, which the DOD law of war manual summarizes as first, helping practitioners interpret and apply specific treaty or customary rules. Second, providing a general guide for conduct during war when no specific rules apply. And three, working as interdependent and reinforcing parts of the coherent system. So as far as definitions go, the DOD's definition of the principle of proportionality is pretty straightforward. It is, it is quote, the principle that even where one is justified in acting, one must not act in a way that is unreasonable or excessive. So that's the foundational principle of proportionality. As to the specific rule the DOD has chosen to adopt and enforce to effectuate the principle of proportionality in the conduct of hostilities, Things are a bit more black and white, but not much more. Um, as we'll see, there remains plenty of room for disagreement. Um, a good place to start for understanding any rule, as any good lawyer knows, is the rule's text. Um, for the DOD, proportionality as a rule imposes two primary requirements on combatants. The first, combatants have to take feasible precautions in planning and conducting attacks to reduce the risk of harm to civilians and other persons and objects protected from being made the object of attack. Second, combatants must refrain from attacks in which the expected loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, and damage to civilian objects incidental to the attack would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage expected to be gained. A lot of verbiage, we'll talk a little more about what each of those means. So an important distinction between the principle of proportionality and the rule of proportionality is when each applies. So while the principle of proportionality always applies and serves as a source of interpretive guidance for courts and states alike, um, the rule of proportionality only applies in the context of an attack. Um, and that, that's a defined term. Looking through Article 49 of Additional Protocol 1, um, an attack specifically means acts of violence against the adversary, whether offense or in defense. Thus, offensive or defensive operations that do not amount to violence and do not result in loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, or damage to civilian objects, such as, for example, cyber attacks, um, are not attacks under, under um, LOAC or IHL. Um, so thus, even under the international community's definition of attack, um, there is no legal requirement for um, any proportionality analysis if it's not an attack. Um, so with that, um, there are a few key fe features to the American understanding of proportionality as a rule that are worth emphasizing here. First, uh, the DOD manual regards incidental harm to civilians as inevitable, and it actually uses that word inevitable. For that reason, proportionality does not require that no incidental damage result from attack. It only requires that the incidental harm not be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage expected to be gained. And of course, where possible or quote feasible, as the as the manual actually says, um, steps should be taken to minimize uh, incidental harm. So, 
you might be wondering what constitutes a feasible precaution. Well, in 2023, the DOD updated its manual to provide commanders further guidance on this. In short, what is feasible depends greatly on context, but under DOD rules, it is generally feasible to, for example, uh, review the accuracy and reliability of the information supporting an assessment that a potential target is a military objective. Um, you could check potential target locations against no strike lists, uh, review previously what, you know, targets that, that you had previously established, review them at, in, at, at reasonable interview intervals, um, especially when uh, new information comes to light. Um, it also involves taking steps when carrying out a planned attack to confirm that the object set to be attacked is, in fact, the intended target of the attack. Um, and so basically, uh, you know, as lawyers, you might recognize these principles as sort of like basically doing your due diligence, right? Making sure that what you plan to do um, actually ends up what you actually ends up doing what you wanted to do, right? Um, so to be sure, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but it provides a good window into what uh, the DOD expects of its commanders. Uh, regarding feasible precautions. So second, so the principle, another key feature of, of American LOAC is that the principle of proportionality generally does not extend to prohibiting incidental excessive harm to military objects and personnel, even those who cannot be made the, the deliberate target of the attack. Um, so that includes medics, chaplains, the wounded and the sick. However, as with civilians, commanders still have to take feasible precautions to reduce the risk of harm uh, to military personnel and objects that are protected from being made the object of an attack. Um, and the example the manual uses, you can reference it, it's in your uh, some of your materials, is the um, is hospital ships. Right? And, the, and the manual quotes uh, uh, Robert Tucker's Law of War and Neutrality at Sea and says, for even though every effort must be made to avoid fire upon, firing upon or bombing hospital ships, uh, the presence of the latter cannot serve to exempt nearby military objectives from attack for fear that a hospital vessel might thereby suffer, suffer incidental in. So third, another key feature of American LOAC is that determining whether an attack is proportional has both objective and subjective components. Objectively, a commander's decision on proportionality must be reasonable. The commander must be able to explain the expected military importance of the target and why the anticipated civilian collateral injury or damage is not expected to be excessive. Under the DOD's understanding of proportionality, doing so satisfies the reasonableness or objective standard. Basically looking for, it, it's, a, it's a common sense rule, right? If the commander can reasonably articulate what the military advantage is um, uh, and why the, the expected harm is not excessive, then the standard is met from an objective standard. Subjectively, the DOD's understanding of proportionality allows for what it describes as variations in how reasonable persons would apply the principle of proportionality in any given circumstance. So look, people, as, as we've certainly seen in the media, people disagree over this. The decisive variable that informs one commander's proportionality decision may not be the decisive variable for another commander. And on this point, the manual includes a great observation from the 2010 policy paper written by uh, Janina Dill for the Oxford Institute for Ethics and Law of Armed Conflict. He says that while the proportionality judgment call is pushed uh, higher up the chain of command as more civilian damage is expected to result from attack, it remains essentially subjective and personal. Military lawyers acknowledge that. As a result, different professionals are likely to come to different conclusions about whether an anticipated collateral damage is excessive in the same situation when applying the law in good faith. Commanders suggest that proportionality judgments in, rea in reality often boil down to asking, can the estimated collateral damage damage be further reduced through timing, choice of weapons, or angle of attack? If the answer is no, the principle is considered to be fulfilled from a subjective standpoint. Another way that the DOD's view on proportionality is, 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 is distinctive is um, it affords considerable deference to commanders who actually have to make the decision. Uh, such deference, it, it reflects the reality of the fog of war, which you, that term you hear, fog of war. It also reflects the imprecise nature of the law of armed conflict and the serious personal liability awaiting the commander who gets it wrong. This can include criminal penalties, potentially. Um, this deference also reflects the sort of common understanding that proportionality is a legal rule that demands good faith efforts at compliance. It's not supposed to be this twisted game of gotcha that turns on arcane legal minutiae. It only, it only asks good faith compliance from commanders. 
Um, so for the same reason, and given assessing proportionality can be what the manual calls open-ended, subjective and imprecise, and, and given that it can involve a, a comparison of unlike quantities and values, the United States actually tracks the Rome Statute in adopting a clearly excessive standard. That is, proportionality is only violated when the incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof, is, quote, clearly excessive in relation to the overall advantage anticipated, end quote. Clearly excessive. So much for the same reasons, uh, commander's decisions under the, under the American view are assessed based on information they had at the time of the decision, not what information may have come to light later. This is known as the Rendulic rule. Um, similarly, commanders can only be held responsible for the expected harm consequential to their decision. Of course, this expectation has to be reasonable. A commander can't 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 uh, keep himself willfully ignorant. Um, but an attack that causes far more civilian harm than the commander reasonably expected beforehand does not violate proportionality. So we've talked a little bit about the the nature of, of the American view on proportionality in LOAC. Who actually makes these decisions uh, when it comes down to it? and how do we enforce this, these rules? Well. Although proportionality decisions are sometimes imagined as at being made at the highest levels of government, in the American military, proportionality decisions are made at all echelons. And this includes by senior leaders at the, at the strategic level, going all the way down to junior officers and commanders on the battlefield. And according to the DOD manual, those responsible for making the decisions and judgments required by the principle of proportionality are those who have the authority to make the decisions. This certainly includes those with command authority, but it also extends to planners, support staff, even non-commissioned officers to some extent. Even the most junior listed and soldier has somewhat of an obligation to proportionality, although they don't think of it in these terms. All soldiers in the American military have a positive legal duty to refuse to obey orders that are manifestly or patently illegal. This could easily tie into a proportionality analysis. The bottom line, the, the degree of responsibility for complying with proportionality turns largely on a person's role and assigned to military duties in planning or conducting attack. And, and again, this can extend from the lowest level echelon all the way up to, to national strategy level leaders. So there's a few reasons why the United States extends decision-making authority on matters concerning proportionality to its lowest levels of command. One reason is, is just simply practicality. That is, we want people who are actually pulling the trigger to be mindful of LOAC, right? They're the last best chance to ensure that it's complied with. So of course we want them thinking about it. A second reason reflects sort of a, a longstanding commitment by the United States under the Geneva Conventions to educate its service members on the law of armed conflict. And it reflects a sort of trust the United States has in its service members to observe the rules of proportionality and other rules of the law of armed conflict in war. So specifically the Geneva Conventions requires the United States to quote, undertake in times of peace as in time of war, disseminate the text of the Geneva Convention as widely as possible in their respective countries, and in particular to include the study thereof in their programs of military and if possible civil instruction that the principles thereof may become known to all their armed forces and to the entire population. The third reason why uh, 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 the U.S. trusts uh, proportionality decisions to all levels of command it, is that it reflects an organizational need to delegate decision making. And that often means uh, information available at the tactical level may not match that at the strategic level or vice versa. Right. On the one hand, strategic decision makers may not have the sort of on the ground situational awareness, say, like a platoon leader would. Um, on the other hand, as the manual provides, assessing the military advantage expected to be gained from an attack may require knowing the broader strategy being employed by the attacking party or knowing intelligence information about the strategic operational context in which the attack takes place. Thus, with information so spread out and not always evenly allocated, it's better for all parties involved to be mindful of their obligation to ensure good faith compliance with LOAC. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as to accountability, say when a service member runs afoul of these rules, as to accountability for violations of proportionality, the United States has a pretty robust enforcement mechanism. At the forefront of this uh, for U.S. service members is the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So although there is no war crimes punitive article under the UCMJ, there are nonetheless multiple articles under which a war crime 
could be punished as a violation of military criminal law. And this includes like murder, rape, uh, things of that sort. Um, such infamous war crimes as the 1968 Eli massacre and the 2012 Kandahar massacre will all prosecuted under the UCMJ. And that's just, that's one of many, or two of many rather. For crimes committed outside the United States by those not subject to the UCMJ, excuse me, because bear in mind the UCMJ, remember, only extends to service members. The United States also has the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act um, codified at 18 U.S.C. Section 212. As the Department of Justice describes it, MEJA permits the exercise of criminal jurisdiction over crimes committed outside the United States if at the time of the offense, the offender was, one, employed by the armed forces outside of the United States, two, accompanying the armed forces outside of the United States, or three, a member of the armed forces. It applies to members of the armed forces who, who uh, leave active duty or leave the service, um, and this, this law allows them to still be held accountable for crimes they may have committed while they were members of the military, although they are no longer subject to the use of the MJ. But one of the defendants of the uh, 2006 Mahmoudia massacre in Iraq uh, was charged under this law. In addition to the UCMJ and MEJA, the United States, pursuant to its Geneva Convention obligations, has its own war crime statute in federal criminal, or, excuse me, federal civilian criminal law. The 1996 War Crimes Act, uh, which is at 18 U.S.C. Section 241, this empowers the federal government to investigate and charge war crimes committed by any person, whether inside or out the United States, as long as the victim or offender is a national of the United States, an alien lawfully admitted for the permanent residence, or a member of the armed forces of the United States, regardless of national. It also extends, it, it also applies if the offender alone is present in the United States, regardless of the nationality of the victim or the offender. So you may have seen this statute in the news recently, in fact, on December 6, um, 2023, this year, um, just a few days ago, the United States, for the first time ever, charged someone under its war crime statute, and the case involved four members of the Russian military who are um, who are alleged to have abducted and tortured the U.S. national in Ukraine. The first time it's ever been used. At the international, of course, although the United States is not a party to the Rome Statute, and U.S. citizens are generally beyond the ICC's jurisdiction, the ICC would have jurisdiction over U.S. citizens who commit war crimes uh, within the territory of a country that is a party to the Rome Statute. So there's lots of enforcement mechanisms there. So we understand what the DOD's perspective on LOAC is. We understand how uh, who's responsible for making decisions about it, how it's enforced. Let's talk more about how um, it's often misunderstood, how LOAC is often misunderstood. So there are three common ways people misunderstand and, and in some cases misapply the rule of proportionality. The first way inflates proportionality with an idea of, of fairness to the enemy or or leveling the playing field. Uh, when it's thus mistakenly construed, some people think of proportionality as the requirement that a responding military's degree of force uh, must not exceed that of the initial degree of force used by the enemy. Put differently, this is like saying um, it's illegal to bring a gun to a knife fight. That violates proportionality. A gun's not proportional to a knife. Um, Second, another way people misunderstand and misapply proportionality is that sometimes people confuse proportionality with symmetry. No less authority than the New York Times a few days ago did this. Um, uh, the, the idea of symmetry is that no more destruction and violence may be wrought than is minimally necessary to neutralize a threat or, or quote, you know, even the score, so to speak. As an example, uh, let's say a small squad of enemy combatants fire upon um, Amer an American platoon. And let's say they kill a U.S. service member. An incorrect interpretation of proportionality would say that while the U.S. military may respond to the enemy squad's attack, it may only do so on some, some kind of commensurate basis, or that it would be prohibited from, for example, wiping out an entire brigade of enemy combatants of the same hostile force. Neither of these interpretations of proportionality has any basis in law. As to the first, right, like the idea of a fair fight uh, between forces. Although the law of armed conflict prohibits methods of warfare that exploit adversaries' good faith compliance with LOAC, such as perfidy, use of human shields, things of that sort, nothing in LOAC requires a military force to be fair to an adversary or that or that a military force can't respond to even a small armed attacks uh, with overwhelming use of force and violence of action. After all, as interpreted under the DOD standards, proportionality contemplates only incidental harm as it affects civilians and their property not military objects. This includes personnel. 
Um, although, of course, commanders still have to take feasible precautions to minimize harm to protected personnel, such as chaplains, medics, well, wounded and sick, POWs, things of like that. Um, similarly, nothing in LOAC requires one military's response to be somehow symmetrical or commensurate to the severity of its losses or only match another's, uh, another military's initial aggression. This misunderstanding is often the result of, of confusing proportionality with humanity, or some people call it unnecessary suffering, uh, the latter of which forbids the infliction of suffering, injury, or destruction unnecessary uh, to accomplish a legitimate military objective. So the difference between this and proportionality might be thought of in terms of prohibiting needless cruelty. A common example is the treatment of prisoners of war or combatants who are hors de combat uh, due to injury or illness. Um, and that hors de combat means basically you're out of the fight, right? Um, often due to injury, illness, or some other kind of uh, uh, shipwreck, for example. Um, in these cases, uh, such personnel already have, they've already been removed from the fight. There's no military advantage in adding to their suffering. Confusion also arises when people conflate the low act rule of proportionality with the use ad bellum principle of proportionality, which is an entirely separate body of law that concerns whether the basis for going to war in the first place is just. So to continue with the example involving the squad of enemy combatants from before, LOAC would permit the United States from destroying not just an enemy brigade, but the entirety of an adversary's military force. Indeed, the contrary interpretation would make little sense in a state of war with a declared hostile force, in which you know offensive operations are can be planned and executed without prior provocation. Uh, so to be sure, there might be wise policy reasons not to escalate a conflict, such as when asymmetric warfare hangs on the support of local nationals, but there's no legal requirement. This brings me to the third way people misunderstand proportionality. You might recall from earlier how the DOD manual requires that incidental harm not be, quote, excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage expected to be gained, end quote. That language, the concrete and direct military advantage, is as frequently misunderstood as it is overlooked in the media. While a military advantage may not be merely hypothetical or speculative, according to the manual, the advantage does not does need to excuse me does not need to be immediate. The mark of distinction again is good faith. There should be a good faith expectation that the attack will make a relevant and proportional contribution to the goal of the military attack involved. So, in addition, and perhaps most critically to the American understanding of proportionality. The concept of military advantage contemplates not just immediately discernible tactical gains, but strategic level gains as well. As the DOD's report on the Persian Gulf War put it, although the balancing aspect of proportionality commonly occurs on a target by target basis, uh, it, it may also be weighed in overall terms of campaign objectives. An analogy might illustrate this concept well. Imagine if I asked you to take out a $20 bill and throw it in the trash. Now, I expect most of you would probably refuse to do so just because it's wasteful. It's so obviously wasteful. Um, now imagine I'm a medical doctor and I inform you that your child has a medical condition that requires life-saving surgery that costs upwards of $100,000. Although the financial cost of the surgery is substantially greater than simply throwing away $20, I would think most of you, with the means to do so at least, would not hesitate to pay for the surgery. Through a lens of low act, Throwing away the $20 bill would likely violate proportionality, but the $100,000 surgery, even though it's 5,000 times more costly, would not violate proportionality. Um, this may seem intuitive to many of you, and of course, I, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but as a simple as simple of a concept as this is, people seem to quickly forget how this works when applied to real-life armed conflict. So thus, even in the same way we spend our material wealth to secure things we value, we wage war even at great expense, to secure things of political value when all their avenues of resolution have failed. Some keen observers might detect that we've kind of shifted focus away from how a state wages war or use in bellow to why it wages war, which is use ad bellum, which is to which use ad bellum is, is addressed. After all, value is subjective. Few would likely disagree that spending $100,000 to cure a fatally ill child is a proportional expenditure. But what about spending $100,000 to hire, say, a contract killer to murder someone. That might be wrong, but is it no longer proportional? Depends on what you're valuing here. Indeed, 
It's often disagreements over what to value and how much to value it that inform a person's opinion as to whether an attack is proportional under LOAC. Um, that has certainly been the case in Israel's battle with Hamas. To those who believe Israel has no right to exist and Jews have to and Jews have no right to fight for their lives, right? Any use of force Israel takes to defend itself will appear wasteful and needless and thus disproportionate. So unfortunately, this is a topic that we don't really have time to discuss in depth, in depth today, and I don't wish to digress too much. So for now, I'll offer two just brief observations. First, I caution you not to walk away with the conclusion that proportionality means that as long as the ends are just, all means are just as well. That's not the rule of proportionality. This, if that were the rule, it would cut low act and lend sort of a veneer of legitimacy to the to exactly the sort of human depravity of past. Um, second, even where use ad bellum and use in bello uh, might be in tension with one another theoretically, that tension in real life and operational context can often be a feature rather than a bug. It is precisely that tension that undergirds the sort of merciful restraint uh, that anchors us to what is good and decent and which in turn secures a sort of more just peace for which war is ever supposed to be waged in the first place. Um, so I, I, I can see my time is running out here. I've got about a minute left. Um, there are easy cases and hard cases to apply proportionality, right? It's, it's, it's not always cut and dry here. Um, I, I'll, I'll say that um, in, in the reference materials I provided, for example, we have uh, the tunnel situation. The, the, the big question now is, 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 is it proportional for Israel to flood the tunnel? Well, there's a lot of questions that go into that. Um, see, my time is up. I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, but in, for now, I think, I think that wraps it up. I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, Captain Wheatley. Uh, Maurice, I turn this over to you. Thanks very much, Alana. Um, good evening, good, good afternoon, good evening, uh, um, uh, wherever you are for joining us from around the world. Um, I uh, um, would like to start with, uh, with, with a story, if I may. Um, God meets Moses in the desert, as we know from the story of the Bible. And he says, you know what, Moses, I want you to bring the Jewish people out of the land of Egypt. They've been slaves there for too long. It's time for them to leave. Moses says to God, no, what do you want from me? Where are we going? And God says to him, don't worry. I'm taking you to a place where it's amazing. It's paradise on earth, a land flowing with milk and honey. Trees will grow everywhere. There'll be amazing agriculture. You'll be able to, to make the desert bloom. Um, just really amazing things. Moses looks at him and says, I don't understand. What's the catch? He says, well, what can you do? Your neighbors aren't such great things. Um, unfortunately, that's the situation uh, um, that we uh, uh, that we live in here in Israel. Um, our neighbors are uh, um, sometimes uh, uh, quite uh, challenging for us. Um, and, and, and it means that we, we often find ourselves in a situation where we need to literally uh, um, fight for our lives. And, uh, um, and that's something which we, we need to do on a constant basis. Um, we find ourselves constantly uh, um, questioned as to whether we have that right to defend ourselves. We have people like Francesca Albanez, the special rapporteur for the, the UN uh, um, Human Rights Council, uh, claiming that Jews don't even have the right to self-defense. Um, so I beg to, degree, uh, to, to disagree. Um, we, are, um, we, we, we experienced that event of no right to self-defense um, some 75 years ago, and uh, we have no intention of going back there. So with the uh, um, opening comments, I'd like to just present a, 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 a presentation. Um, so I, I hope you'll be able to, uh, to see it. Um, let me just uh, um, make sure that it works. There we go. I hope you can all see that. Uh, um, uh, um, and, 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 and based on this, I'm going to make my, my, my comments. I'll try and keep them uh, um, as, as short as possible um, and, and on the subject. So as you can see from, 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 from this first slide, um, there are a number of things that we have to understand about IHL before we can even get into the subject of proportionality. Firstly, IHL in war, people die. That has to be a given. Not only soldiers die, civilians can also potentially die. Sometimes it's legitimate, 
sometimes it's not legitimate. That's the first uh, 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 um, point. The second point is that in general, IHL assumes that, uh, and, and really without any real basis, that, that people are involved in a decent war. Um, there is no such thing as a decent war. Um, the, the, the days of tanks versus tanks on a wide open battlefield um, have really uh, um, not been around for a very, very long time. And what we've mostly been seeing for uh, um, the last probably uh, six to seven decades is this asymmetrical war. Proper armies that often respect uh, um, the rules of war, fighting against an enemy that doesn't really care about the rules of war, isn't bound by the, ru the, the, the rules of war, or doesn't see itself bound by the rules of war, and has no real interest in, um, in upholding the rules of war. This allows uh, um, these, uh, 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 the other side to use and abuse civilian, the civilian population. They understand the laws of war. They have done, that has to be a given. The, 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 the terrorists, let's call them on the other side, um, for want of a better word, um, understand very well the, the, the laws of war. They understand particularly how to use them in their favor. And that has to be uh, uh, also taken into account. Now, it really does lend itself um, to the abuse of the terrorists because they know two basic uh, uh, ideas. Firstly, they won't stand trial. No one is issuing a, a, um, a, an arrest warrant, not for Osama bin Laden and, and not for uh, uh, Ismail Hania and not for uh, uh, Yekhe Senwar. Um, no one's doing that. They have no fear really of uh, um, any type of repercussions, any type of accountability. Um, in most cases, they will, for again, for better or for worse, never get to that trial stage, but they'll, they'll rather be killed um, on the battlefield uh, um, in, in one way or another. Now, and they don't really care about their good name. America, Israel, European countries, we have an interest, an international interest as part of really uh, um, international relations to ensuring that we are part of that general uh, um, body of nations that has an interest in upholding the law, has an interest in up in fighting justly, and we ensure that that is actually uh, uh, the case. Now, unfortunately, accountability, as I said uh, uh, before, has been a subject of uh, um, of much skepticism, really, in 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 in, in wars, um, with few exceptions, um, uh, really, accountability. Um, for war crimes have been uh, uh, the fate of the losers um, and never those of, uh, or, or often never those of the victors, unless you're talking about entirely, uh, really, uh, events that are off the scale, which are completely condemned. Everybody knew they were condemned, and yet uh, the soldiers uh, were involved in them anyway. And that's something um, that has to be uh, dealt with. Um, and, and so the exception to that one being, obviously, is, uh, is, the, is, the, is Israel. Israel is held constantly to this standard that doesn't apply really to the rest of the world. As uh, uh, um, Captain Wheatley uh, uh, so rightly said before, you have all types of people who are inventing standards that don't exist. Well, since the, the terrorists in Gaza are only attacking Israel only, attacking Israel and indiscriminately targeting Israel's um, civilian population with dumb bombs and really not effective dumb bombs, so Israel must restrain itself and it cannot really respond with all force. That's the, exactly the example that he gave. Uh, um, they're coming to this battle with a knife, and we're responding with, with tanks, not even a gun. And that is perfectly legitimate, unless you really buy into this idea that the Jewish state has to be held um, to a separate uh, uh, um, standard. Now, before we can uh, address proportionality, um, we have to uh, look at really a little bit of distinction, this idea of who do you even attack? Obviously, uh, um, you cannot attack in war um, anyone. Proportionality talks about the idea of civilians being uh, uh, um, killed and when that is uh, acceptable, when that is unacceptable. But really, you have to understand that on the basis of what is the basic uh, requirement of distinction that only uh, um, requires that the object and the person being attacked is part of the enemy's, enemy's military apparatus and is accordingly a military objective. Um, it can be things that are by their nature, by their location, by their purpose or their use, 
make an effective contribution to that military action. And so really what we're talking about in, uh, uh, in the circumstances of Israel and its fight against Hamas is the entire Hamas uh, um, infrastructure in the Gaza Strip. Um, it means that all of the terrorists, it means that from the, from the lowest of the terrorists to Yechia Sinwar, from, uh, um, from the terrorists who uh, uh, infiltrated Israel and was raping uh, uh, um, our babies, our women, and beheading uh, uh, um, the elderly and, and, and others, um, all the way up to the head. Um, all of these people in the middle are uh, legitimate targets. They are um, part of that infrastructure that Israel can legitimately uh, uh, target and uh, legitimately kill. So how do we, uh, um, in this circumstance then, um, understand the application of distinction um, when you're talking about um, an enemy that deliberately embeds itself, that places its infrastructure, its weapons in the heart of the civilian uh, population, as we've seen, uh, I hope that many of you have, have seen um, really the excellent products being put out by um, the IDF spokesman during this war, um, showing how every single, um, almost every single civilian institution has been used by the terrorists to hide weapons, um, to uh, um, attack IDF uh, um, soldiers, to shoot missiles, um, to shoot rockets, uh, to shoot mortars. We're talking about schools, places of worship, hospitals. We're talking about mortars and rockets being uh, um, hidden in houses under the beds of children, babies, under cribs, everything. Really, we've seen everything on that scale. And, and so what do you do in that situation? How do you re necessarily distinguish between um, the military targets and the civilian targets? <coughs> Excuse, uh, I, I, I excuse, uh, um, please excuse me for my coughs. I'm, I'm a little bit under the weather, um, but uh, uh, um, so uh, sorry, I apologize. Um, how do you then implement that? And, and what should a law abiding uh, um, army do when it when the enemy dresses like a civilian? Who do you even classify as a civilian when when you're not talking about a war in which the other side is wearing a uniform, is carrying its guns openly? Um, has an insignia. You're talking about one person next to the other person. You have no idea really who is a, um, a civilian and who is a combatant. And and then you have this whole instance of human shields. We know the terrorists are using civilians as human shields. What do you then do in those circumstances? Um, uh, uh, as Captain Wheatley uh, so, quick, so correctly uh, pointed out, even when you're talking about a hospital ship in the vicinity of um, legitimate targets. You don't avoid the, the strike because of the fear of uh, uh, attacking a hospital ship or, or, of, or of accidentally attacking a hospital ship. But here we're talking about an entirely different situation. Here we're talking about a situation in which hospitals are used intentionally by terrorists as command centers, as bases for storing weapons, as launching sites, for uh, 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 rockets, because they understand that their best weapon alongside their rockets is the use of international opinion, of public opinion, of the media, of, well, look what happens when Israel attacks hospitals. Now, this is an inherent part of, uh, um, of, of the discussion, and, and, and really it lends itself to this idea of, of, of proportionality. When uh, uh, um, when can you uh, get into uh, uh, the subjects of, well, what is the incidental damage caused by attacking a legitimate target? Now, we all talk about proportionality, um, but as, as we all know, proportionality is a, is a little bit of an elusive term. Um, it's really uh, possibly, whilst it, it, it has different forms, um, probably the, 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 the best form is in uh, the additional protocol, uh, uh, the first additional protocol, Article 51, uh, uh, um, really five. Let's look at the bottom part of, uh, um, of, of, the, of this slide. Um, where, uh, uh, this is an, proportionality is described and is really implemented via a negative. It's not a positive as to what you can do. It's a negative as, what, as to what you can't do. So 51.5 uh, 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 51, uh, 51, prohibits any attack 
that where they expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage civilian objects, which would be excessive in relation to the concrete military advantage anticipated. So really we're talking about a, a, a test which involves really multiple, uh, um, multiple levels. Um, and, and, and those levels have to be really peeled back. We're talking about, firstly, attacking a legitimate military target. Obviously, proportionality doesn't give an answer to attacking a civilian target. Civilian targets are always off bounds unless they're being used by the enemy, purpose, nature, use, uh, um, as we uh, described uh, before, as a military target. Um, and then here we're talking about what the, the, the expected loss of life is excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. So how do you then adjudicate proportionality? Can you, as many people uh, uh, um, and, and, and commentators look out and say, well, Israel attacked a school, they killed five people, killed 500 people, and that is clearly disproportionate. Clearly that uh, um, equation is, is an, an argument is is lacking a fundamental element of the equation as proportionality is described and understood in international law. Because without knowing, you can't base any uh, a conclusion whatsoever simply by looking at the end result. Rather, you have to know what exactly the military advantage expected was um, and, 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 and really what the target being attacked was. Now, this is sometimes uh, um, obviously very difficult in our circumstances when it appears that Israel is simply attacking a school. So why are you attacking a school? That, that, that obviously can't be legitimate. But when you understand that the school is a storage area for rockets in the vicinity of the school, um, there are rocket launchers. Through the classrooms of the school, there are access tunnels um, or, or access vents to attack tunnels, then all of that story suddenly becomes a different equation. It suddenly takes on a different form. It isn't just simply attacking a civilian target, which would obviously uh, um, be illegitimate. It isn't attacking a target where, well, maybe there might have been something, but the number of deaths is clearly disproportionate. But it's really giving that target a little bit more life. And so I would suggest, uh, uh, um, based on that, caution whenever you read anything that says Israel acted in a disproportionate manner. You have to understand what A, happened. B, you have to understand what Israel was attacking. Without that, it is impossible to really understand um, the, uh, uh, the real uh, um, idea of what is going on or to talk about uh, uh, proportionality. Now, just to bring it down a, 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 a few levels, uh, um, when, when you try and implement these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, provisions, you also have to take into account the circumstances of the conflict. So most conflicts of Western armies are conducted far from home um, with no real threat to the, to, to, to the civilian. So, for example, we had periods of time uh, um, during the NATO bombings in, in Yugoslavia um, where there was a no damage to soldiers uh, policy. And then on the other hand, we had uh, in Afghanistan, you had occasions where the American army adopted a policy, um, at least according to a, a, a media report, of zero collateral damage. You can do that when you're fighting far away from home. You can do that when your civilian population isn't under an immediate bombardment, isn't suffering an immediate threat from those people um, that, that, that you're about to attack. Because it doesn't really matter whether you attack that, that, that terrorist. You attack him today, you attack him tomorrow. There isn't an immediate threat going on, uh, um, for, let, let, let's say for, 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 for all intents and purposes, um, while America's fighting in Afghanistan, there's no immediate threat of, uh, 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 of Afghanistan or Iraq firing a, a, a missile um, into New York. That's not our situation. Israel and uh, 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 and Gaza are, 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 are intertwined, are interconnected, are immediately next to each other. There is that immediate proximity. 
there is this constant danger, a constant threat. Uh, and as we talk, uh, um, we, we have to understand that, that just this afternoon, um, Israel's uh, um, massive civilian population, for those of you that, uh, that, that are unfamiliar um, with Israel's demography, uh, 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 demography and, and, and really geography, 80% of Israel's population lives in the coastal plain. That's where most of our uh, um, uh, um, industry is. And just this afternoon, there was a barrage of 30 missiles, long-range missiles, or relatively long-range for the, the conflict that we're in, um, fired by Hamas uh, and, and the other terrorists in, in the Gaza Strip, indiscriminately targeting that civilian population into Tel Aviv into those uh, uh, civilian areas. Now, while we've all heard, uh, uh, um, uh, for all intents and purposes, that, that, that food's running out and fuel's running out and water's running out, what uh, appears to never be running out for the terrorists uh, in Gaza is, are, 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 are their rockets, um, and they keep on firing them. And so this gives really an urgency in any type of uh, uh, um, operation that you're carrying out, and also, affects the really the equation of proportionality now i have to before we get into any specific uh, uh, um any specifics i have to just remind myself of of what uh, 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 captain wheatley so rightly said uh, um as the housekeeping and, and, and openings and and really i should have said this at the beginning what i'm saying is obviously my opinion it doesn't represent the official opinion of the idf the idf mag uh, um uh, definitely not the state of israel um, it's uh, my understanding of, uh, um, of, of of the events and and of the fighting that's going on, albeit on the basis of uh, um, uh, many years in the IDF and within that uh, uh, periods of time when I was actively also involved in uh, um, in, in 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 legal advice for operational uh, uh, areas. So really, what we're talking about is is to to put this into in in, in, in to contextualize it and to give a, a concrete example. When you're talking about, we now have to shoot at, we've, we, we've seen this barrage of missiles attacking Israel's uh, uh, civilian population, and we have the capability now to uh, uh, technologi technologically identify the launch site and immediately attack. Now, on the one hand, we're talking about some uh, uh, millions of Israeli citizens that could potentially be uh, um, under threat. On the other hand, we're talking about firing uh, uh, of rockets from within the civilian population. How long do you wait when you take into account just two days ago, uh, um, uh, the IDF exposed a, a truck uh, um, which, uh, uh, which had been uh, uh, loaded with these long range uh, um, uh, 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 rockets. And, and it really reminds us of, uh, um, uh, uh, of the war in Iraq and, 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 and really the, the, the allied forces hunting these uh, uh, um, missile launchers all over, uh, uh, all over Southern Iraq and, and, and also in Southern Lebanon during uh, um, the Second Lebanon War in 2006. So now you're hunting these long range missiles and you can respond immediately. How long do you have to wait to take into account how many people are around that rocket launcher? How many people are being used as, a, uh, 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 as, 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 as human shields? Because that's the aim of the terrorists. How long do you have to wait when you know that, well, if that rocket launcher moves, they could be, you could lose all ability to attack that a target and uh, and thereby endanger uh, um, potentially um, millions of, uh, um, of, 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 of people um, who would be subject to that indiscriminate uh, attack. Now, these lead us into really the concrete questions of how do you even identify the civilians? So when you're talking about, you've identified the launch area, you've identified uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the source of the uh, of the rockets being fired. You you understand. You even have a visual from uh, um, from whatever capability it is. Who do you know is a civilian? How do you identify the civilian when the civilian isn't wearing a weapon? It's he, just it just looks like another person. The combatant is another civilian. When you see five people around the the rocket launcher, are they civilians? Are they combatants? Are they fighting? When you see fifty people around, are they part of that? force that is defending that brings us into this whole question of direct participation in hostilities who are uh, um who are civilians who lose their uh, uh, um their status as civilians because we're talking about proportionality incidental damage of civilians um when you attack a legitimate target it's not talking about when you're attacking 
a civilian who's acting uh, um, like a combatant. So um, there was just a, 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 a long symposium on the war in, a, a, in the Ukraine um, uh, just a, a, a while ago now. And, and one of the, the, the subjects discussed there at length was the, the app that was developed by the Ukrainian government and then spread to the population that allowed every member of the, of the population to uh, report on Russian troop movements. And the conclusion of the symposium was that that app and anyone who used it were very, very dangerous because it took a civilian, it gave him a military uh, uh, position and involved him in active uh, 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 military uh, 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 activities and therefore turned that civilian into a legitimate target. So really that's that's part of the problem. Um, and, and who do you identify as a civilian? Who not? If you listen to the news, if you listen to CNN, to the New York Times, Israel has killed 20,000 civilians. Apparently we've killed no terrorists whatsoever. Um, we are the most uh, uh, um, incompetent army in the world. Um, and we are only attacking civilians and, and no terrorists, but, uh, uh, um, but the terrorists are just giving themselves up because we're of their, of their, they suddenly care about the, the Gazan civilians. So really that's not true. We know that's not true. Um, and uh, uh, um, so that's part of the equation. The second part of this whole discussion of proportionality is what role does intelligence play? Let's say that I know that the, uh, um, because of intelligence, I have an informant that says that in this uh, a mosque, there is a massive store, uh, 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 store, uh, stockpile of, of weapons. And I attack that. I can show no clear evidence of what it was. The, 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 the informant, the person who gave us the evidence, cannot be brought for, for example, if I now need to defend myself in a criminal trial. How do I then implement or explain the reason that I attacked? Because as, a, 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 as a, 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 a Captain Wheatley so rightly said, we're talking about the understanding of the reasonable commander as to why he attacked that 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 position. So here, for example, there's a big difference between um, attacks carried out by the IDF via the Air Force um, on many occasions and ground forces. Air Force, uh, as we know, most of the, uh, um, the time, we have uh, um, predetermined uh, uh, targets and uh, they're not uh, uh, just spontaneous targets except for close uh, assistance. And, and so you have that ability to, to really analyze at greater depth uh, what's going on um, and what's happening. Now, does proportionality require uh, um, every soldier having a press professor of law at, by his side? And the answer to that is absolutely not. Israel uh, um, has uh, courses for um, our, our military commanders, for our officers. We educate them extensively in the laws of war. We provide them with the background of what the, the, the different considerations are. And, uh, and then we empower them to then make those decisions on the ground, not being able to really second guess them because that's the requirement. It's the officer, the reasonable officer on the ground making uh, 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 those decisions. Now, obviously uh, um, it cannot be that, uh, um, that we don't have any uh, legal advice then. And, and, and so the IDF's model is to not only have general courses informing uh, um, the officers of, the, of their uh, um, requirements, and obviously soldiers as well to an extent, um, of, their, of their requirements, um, but rather there are legal advisors from the divisional level upwards in all types of, uh, uh, um, there's two different types of, of, of really uh, uh, um, uh, um, wartime activities. There's the planning stage, in which there really is heavy involvement of uh, legal advisors. Um, in some occasions, uh, um, really uh, um, looking at every single target um, that's been developed by the intelligence in order to decide whether uh, um, that is a legitimate target, whether it can be attacked, what would uh, um, the incidental damage be caused, is that, and does that meet the, the, the requirements of proportionality? So, but, but, I don't want to just leave it at, at, at my level. There's, there's also the, the idea of, of, of implementation. And that's really what I'd like to show you for just a, a, a second. Um, this is a, a compilation of um, different videos from really from the last period of time where we see this idea of proportionality being implemented by um, the Israeli Air Force, where we see targets that were slated for attack.
for whatever reason it may be, predominantly intelligence indicating that there are uh, um, enemy capabilities there, but because of the in involvement of civilians, um, those targets then cannot be attacked. So this example of, uh, uh, um, I hope you had uh, uh, the chance to, to, to read uh, uh, um, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the subtitles as, as we were going along. Um, the, 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 the common uh, denominator were there was that in each of those cases, we had a target that had been predetermined, that the, that the, the, the visual of the site, which goes along with every one of these uh, uh, um, pre-planned attacks, um, clearly shows that there are unexpected or uh, uh, um, or, 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 or too many uh, um, civilians in the vicinity of the attack, and the attack is uh, uh, then averted. Here you have this incident of of the really the the, the playground. Um, if if some of you will remember, in 2014 there was the very unfortunate incident on 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 the beach in Gaza, where uh, um, where uh, um, four children um, were unfortunately killed um, when they were playing uh, uh, football on the beach. Um, their ball appeared to have gone over to an area which was uh, um, known to be a, a Hamas uh, weapons uh, storage room. And, and so when you're looking from above, you can't always see that it's, uh, that it's children. And so the understanding was we had terrorist operatives going to a storage room of weapons and they need to be uh, targeted. Um, unfortunately, in, in hindsight, that wasn't the case. But that's not the question that, that, that needs to be asked as part of uh, uh, IHL. It's what we understood um, at the time of uh, um, the assault. Now, now here's a, 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 an entirely uh, a, um, different uh, story. Um, that uh, what you can see in front of you is the Gaza Strip. Within the Gaza Strip, there is this area. In it, really, this is adjacent to the sea. This is the Mediterranean. Here is Israel. Here you have this area of that's called a humanitarian area where Israel is trying to avoid any type of. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, any type of attack there. And yet, this is what we have. We have the understanding of the terrorists that, well, this is a safe area, a safe haven for attacking Israel. We can shoot from here because there's lots of uh, uh, civilians. So on the one hand, Israel has to try and distinguish between the civilians and the, the combatants. On the other hand, the combatants, terrorists, go specifically into those areas to use them as, uh, 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 as safe havens. And then you get this picture, which is, these are the launches, 120 launches of rockets from within the humanitarian zone, right? So this is an area which is meant to be off limits for uh, uh, Israeli forces. This is an area where you have a huge, uh, 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 um, really a, a concentration of civilians. And specifically from there, that's where uh, the terrorists are now fighting. They don't care about life, human lives. As uh, uh, Khalil al Khaya said, one of the senior uh, Hamas uh, operatives, when he was asked, well, didn't you understand that, that the, the October 7 massacre would cause the death of many uh, 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 Gazans? And his answer very clearly, without really batting an eyelid, was, we don't care. The idea is to put um, the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the Palestinian subject on the table again, and that's it. And so we uh, uh, don't really uh, 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 care how many people die. And that's what they're doing. That's the, the policy that they're implementing, trying to cause as many civilian deaths as possible, using them as, as human shields. Now, just to take this up again a level to uh, the ICC, um, uh, obviously the breach of proportionality being a, 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 a war crime. But as I've said, and as I've, uh, uh, um, and I'm really uh, uh, on record uh, uh, um, constantly on this subject, 
Um, I have no faith whatsoever um, in the ICC, in its ability to do anything whatsoever positive. Um, I believe that it is a useless organization that has a, a, um, one goal and one goal only to vilify Israel now um, and will never bring justice against the terrorists. Um, I bring this uh, provision because there are some acts and some events that have been carried out by the by the Palestinian terrorists, which are clearly violations of the of, of the laws of war and should have been uh, um, already dealt with. Here, when we're talking about just in 2018, that constant use of the kite, the incendiary kites to 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 flying into Israel to attack the civilian population, indiscriminate by nature, causing untold environmental damage, which uh, 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 which is really part of that uh, uh, um, uh, excessive and 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 really part of that 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 crime. And yet, the ICC prosecutor, similar to the fact that the Palestinian Authority pays salaries to terrorists, literally incentivizes the murder of Jews um, and has done nothing about it. Um, I, I, and I therefore have very little to zero faith um, and possibly even negative faith, if it could be um, in the ICC, um, as being an objective uh, um, uh, uh, um, adjudicator in, in, in this discussion. Um, I apologize if I have gone over time a little bit. Um, we are we are enriched by it. Thank you very, very much, uh, especially in the condition that you're in. I know with your throat, um, it was uh, uh, very kind of you to join us tonight and uh, incredibly important. I'd like to turn now uh, to Rabbi Rocklin. And uh, Rabbi Rocklin is going to have a little bit of a different presentation in the sense that he's not coming at this with the perspective of a lawyer, but as, as a rabbi, uh, um, as a chaplain, as a doctor of religious history. Um, and so we're looking forward to that. I, Rabbi Rocklin, the floor is yours. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just uh, wanted to begin with the uh, the same disclaimer. I uh, don't want to forget my disclaimer, uh, just as the first two speakers uh, are not speaking uh, on behalf of uh, their mil military organizations. Uh, I, I am not speaking on behalf uh, of the uh, New Jersey Army National Guard or the U.S. Army. Uh, the remarks are uh, are my are, are my own and my own personal uh, personal views. Um, so I uh, I wanted to to just start uh, with with a story as well. Um, unfortunately, not, not a humorous one, but uh, but I, I think it'll set the tone for uh, for what I'd like to talk about just for the next few minutes. Um, I uh, I still remember very well um, how I was uh, I was a child. Um, well, not a child. It was uh, I roughly uh, I think I was uh, thirteen or fourteen. And uh, I was recording a uh, an oral history uh, of my uh, my uh, my grandfather, who uh, was a partisan in um, in World War II um, and, and lived through the Holocaust um, from from Slovakia. And uh, I still remember very well that uh, the most uh, difficult moment for him uh, was uh, when he discussed uh, a situation in which um, he was about to open fire on the enemy. Um, and he simply stopped uh, and and just couldn't continue and had to had to take a break. Um, it's it's often uh, not uh, the suffering that is experienced directly uh, by the soldier or, uh, or or combatant that 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 hurts the most in 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 in, in the memory and can cause the most trauma. Um, but it's often uh, what the soldier is required to do, uh, even when he's acting uh, justly. Uh, and so there's a human element here uh, that that I think we need to address, and that human element is very, very important, uh, both for understanding the development uh, of uh, just law, uh, of just war, uh, just war tradition in general, broadly speaking, uh, and also in, in terms of understanding how we ought to feel about it today. So what I want to do uh, just for a few minutes is I want to talk about uh, how Judaism. Uh, is is so vitally important uh, in us in helping to establish the basis for uh, the very notion uh, of just war, uh, particularly as it's as it's developed in the Middle Ages and and afterwards. And, and there, there's reasons for this. Um, without the Jewish feeling, uh, the Jewish mentality, uh, the a poetic intuition uh, that undergirds 
uh, the way in which uh, Westerners uh, approach war, we wouldn't really get to uh, a ju the just war tradition the way it's been developed. So let me let me explain what I mean and just quickly go to some examples. Uh, I'm not going to read the sources uh, for the most part uh, that were provided in the uh, in the reader, um, but I'm going to make reference to them. So if you'd like to refer to them now or later, <clears throat> that's fine. But you don't you don't have to have to go to them now. Uh, but if you're interested in any text that I'm going to be referring to, they're all they're all provided in the source reader. Uh, the first uh, story that I wanted to begin with is an ambiguous one, uh, and that's uh, found in Genesis uh, chapter 34. Uh, this is a story of uh, Dina uh, in, in Hebrew, Dinah, is often she's often pronounced in English, uh, who's a daughter of Jacob and, and Leah, and um, she is kidnapped, uh, she, is, she is raped, and she is uh, taken, taken prisoner um, and uh, her brothers, uh, Shimon uh, and, and Levi, uh, Simeon and Levi, come up with a plan uh, to get her uh, to get her back. The plan that they come up with uh, involves uh, killing all of the men uh, of the town uh, that has been, you know, that, that whose leaders have, have effectively gone ahead uh, and and kidnapped her. They come up with a plan. Um, they uh, essentially lure the town into a trap. They tell them that if they get if they get their if they have their men, their men circumcised, uh, they can all join together in an alliance and and marry each other. Uh, the town leader likes the proposal, and they get circumcised. They become weak. They're recovering, and then as they're recovering, uh, Simeon and Levi come into the uh, come into the uh, town and kill kill all of the men. Uh, take the women and the children um, uh, captive uh, to become part of their own tribe, take all of the, uh, you know, loot the city, take everything. And they get back home after this venture, uh, and their father Jacob criticizes them. Uh, instead of celebrating this as a victory, uh, instead he simply has harsh words for them. Uh, and he says to them, uh, this is on the bottom of 145, if you're following the reader, you don't have to be, I'll, I'll read it aloud. He says to them, you have troubled me to make me odious unto the inhabitants of the land, even unto the Canaanites and the Prezites, and, and I, being few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and smite me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. So the objection seems like it could actually simply be practical, meaning it may not be a moral objection. Uh, it may just simply be uh, essentially a tactical or a strategic consideration. You know, why did you go ahead and do this? Um, you adopted this tactic and now look, your strategy is poor. Now the, the other inhabitants are going to come. They're going to retaliate. They're, they're going to attack again. They're going to see us as a threat to our, to our neighbors. You shouldn't have done this. Um, it, at first glance, that's what it seems like he's saying. They respond, his sons respond, uh, second line on 146. And they said, should one deal with our sister as with a harlot? In other words, well, it's worth it. We're not going to tolerate our sister being treated this way. We did what we did. We're not, we don't feel guilty about it. And that's the end of the conversation. Um, the, the chapter ends, the story ends, and we're left with an unresolved situation. Um, we get more light shed on the story a little bit later in, in Genesis chapter 49, where we start to see uh, a moral consideration behind Jacob's comments. Um, he may have been objecting immediately to a, a practical problem that he had. Um, and, and in fact, the story actually, had, there's a, a sort of a, a, a epilogue to the story in which uh, God has to intervene to ensure that those around uh, the Israelites are, are afraid and won't retaliate, won't counterattack. Um, but in, in chapter 49, Jacob is ready to bless, or as we'll see, curse uh, all of his, uh, his sons. And he tells them that he's going to essentially predict their future, tell them what's going to be in store for them uh, at the end of days, long in, 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 in a long, long time. There are different interpretations of exactly what that means, but, uh, but he proceeds to go ahead and first uh, curse Reuben, his his oldest son, for a, a, a sin that he committed against his father. Uh, and then before he gets to blessings, he has two more curses, one for Simeon and one for Levi, the two sons who had gone ahead and effectuated uh, what we now would, would consider uh, would, would consider a massacre. Under the standards of the time, 
uh, it was more complicated, but um, he unloads on them nevertheless. Um, he has harsh words for them. Uh, and here he moves from the practical to the moral. Uh, and he says uh, in verse five, Simeon and Levi are brethren, weapons of violence, their kinship. Let my soul not come into their counsel, unto their assembly. Let my glory not be united. For in their anger, they slew men and their self, and in their self-will, they hoed oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now, clearly, we've moved into a, a different uh, line of reasoning here. Uh, essentially, what we're seeing is an admonition against them uh, for, in, for using a, essentially a disproportionate course of action uh, against another nation. Uh, and his attack against them is, is moral in nature, uh, and it's attacking their very character. Uh, it's saying that they acted out of anger, uh, and it's saying that they were, uh, they were essentially engaged in, uh, in an act of, of, of violence that was not, that was not warranted, uh, and they inherit a curse uh, as a result. This attitude uh, is reflected uh, in various biblical instructions concerning limiting uh, the destructiveness of war, not killing unnecessarily. Now, of course, this is a caveat that should be obvious when we're studying the Bronze Age. Uh, we are dealing with an entirely different calculus when it comes to what is what is and is not morally acceptable. Uh, and so rules that 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 apply then are obviously not close to the rules that we would apply today. Um, but the Bible is absolutely revolutionary in moving. Uh, uh, in, in moving morality in a direction in which human life is valued uh, in various areas, that includes in avoiding the unnecessary killing uh, of others, even even uh, in, in attacking uh, in, in attacking the enemy, distinguishing between uh, men, women, and, and children, even sparing men when when possible, uh, and also uh, when it comes to the treatment of of women. Uh, Moral norms, of course, in the Bronze Age were what we would consider, obviously, beyond atrocious. Um, and yet the Bible goes out of its way um, to move uh, very far in the direction of creating uh, moral codes uh, to, for the protection uh, of the innocent. I don't want to dwell on all of those because they're, they're, they're very detailed in nature, but uh, we have time for one. Uh, and I picked it because I think it's perhaps the most surprising, um, because... In Deuteronomy chapter twenty, we see that you're not even you're not even allowed to use uh, disproportionate force against trees, uh, against fruit trees, uh, and uh, the way that the uh, that the Bible puts it is that there it seems to, and there are many different commentaries that explain this, but a straightforward reading seems to indicate that on the one hand you're going to benefit from a fruit tree, so don't cut it down to make a siege work if you can avoid it. If you can cut down a tree that doesn't grow fruit, do that. Don't be wasteful. Um, but there's this exclamation uh, in the Bible that seems to go further, uh, that, that, that uh, it's interpreted variously, but the straightforward interpretation seems to be uh, asking a, a question, uh, for is the tree of the field man that it should be besieged of thee? In other words, don't be reckless uh, and don't, don't engage in violence that is unnecessary and that need not be done. Uh, be careful and calculating when you make war, target the enemy, do visit destruction when it needs to be visited, um, but don't go ahead and engage in activity that involves un, uh, that involves wanton destruction that just simply isn't uh, isn't necessary. Even you might think uh, that a fruit tree it's not so important, and the Bible tells you no, uh, both for the sake of uh, the productivity of the fruit tree, but also simply because um, uh, it's just unwanted destruction. It's just unnecessary destruction. Don't 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 engage. In it. Now, there are commentators uh, who give a variety of reasons for this, um, and there are two basic schools of thought uh, that I want to focus on now. This is a, a large subject in the corpus of Jewish texts, but I just want to point to two reasons uh, for avoiding unnecessary destruction uh, that are given in Jewish sources. Um, one is uh, essentially a focus on honor or what we would really actually properly call dignity uh, or kavod in, in, in Hebrew. This is a reason that's given uh, by Maimonides 
um, who admonishes uh, judges and, and law courts uh, to be careful even when they punish the truly guilty. Uh, so even if we're, we're, not, we're looking at a very narrow circumstance in which someone is clearly guilty uh, and deserving of punishment, um, he still has to be uh, he still has to be treated humanely. Now, I'm not saying that this is, uh, as the captain noted earlier, this is not the same thing as proportionality, but my, my goal here is not simply to talk about proportionality, but to talk about a mentality that leads to uh, considerations like proportionality uh, and also humane treatment. And so, as Maimonides says, even the guilty have their dignity. Don't take it away from them unless it's necessary uh, to do so. And this is, of course, rooted in an old biblical tradition uh, in which uh, someone who is executed uh, and and is is hanged uh, up on a uh, up on a post or a tree, he has to be brought down before the evening. Uh, it's uh, and there there are com there's a commentary on that that indicates that the reason for this is and it's based on the the biblical verse um, that it, it's just an indignity uh, and it's unnecessary. Uh, so don't so don't don't do it. Uh, and as we know, there were there were many cultures in antiquity and and beyond antiquity. This this reaches out out of antiquity into uh, in, 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 into the future beyond, um, who did hang uh, or or impale bodies uh, and place them on display uh, as they decayed uh, in order to terrorize people. And the Bible goes out of its way to prohibit that. Um, Nachmanides, uh, who's a uh, uh, 13th century medieval Jewish rabbi uh, from, from Spain uh, was involved in a famous uh, disputation uh, uh, be, uh, and, and essentially debate between Jews and Christians in, in Barcelona. Uh, Nachmanides uh, offers a different reason uh, in his commentary on the, uh, on the Torah. Uh, he says that essentially um, you have to be mindful not to behave in the ways that armies uh, tend to behave. Now, he's he's writing in a medieval context uh, in, in 13th century. Uh, and the way he says it is, I'll, I'll, I'll read from the second line of his quote, this is on 147 in the reader. Uh, the well-known custom of forces going to war is that they eat all abominable things, rob and plunder, and are not ashamed even of lewdness and all vileness. The fairest of man by nature comes to be possessed of cruelty and fury when the army advances against the enemy. Therefore, scripture warned, then thou shalt keep thee from every evil. This is a reference to Deut the book of Deuteronomy in the Bible, which gives a general warning that you should avoid uh, every evil in your midst. It then, it then focuses on, on things like camp hygiene, but it seems to be a, a broader injunction. That's how my, Nachmanides interprets it. Uh, and he's not alone in interpreting it that way. Um, and so his reason is, very simply put, don't lose your soul. Do not forget who you are as a human being. War is not an excuse uh, to behave in a manner that is undignified yourself. So conduct yourself uh, with righteousness. Don't engage in sin. And in essentially what, what, uh, what, what, what he's saying as well is conduct yourself with virtue. Now, that's a, that's a complicated word to use, and it's, it's a bigger discussion. Um, but you can see how this parallels uh, Christian considerations in the Middle Ages when it comes to just war theory. Uh, that virtue ethics are important. Uh, you don't want to lose your own humanity uh, as a soldier. There are things that you simply must not do, and you have to protect yourself uh, so that you don't do them. Uh, now, in in the modern era, uh, this led to uh, more modern rabbis echoing this consideration. Rabbi uh, Aaron Lichtenstein, um, a, a very prominent rabbi in the uh, in, in the uh, second half of the twentieth century, and and um, uh, passed away just a few years ago uh, in in Israel. Uh, he, um, I, I have a text provided from him where he points out uh, that the mission, going back to around 200 CE, uh, ancient Jewish uh, code of law that establishes the basis of, of Jewish law afterwards, uh, points out that one individual is considered to be equivalent uh, to an entire world. Uh, and therefore, you have to do a couple of things because of that. You, you have to, con if, if that's your mentality, you have to consider that number one, uh, you have to avoid being unnecessarily cruel to the enemy. Uh, and he cites a, a midrash, a Jewish commentary, going back about a millennium and a half, uh, which references God being sorrowful uh, as the Egyptians are drowning in the Red Sea, even though they were, they were engaged in evil and they were pursuing the Jewish people. 
uh, or the Hebrews as they left Egypt. Uh, nevertheless, God felt sorrow as he drowns them in uh, in the sea. And so uh, Rabbi Lichtenstein's point was, uh, you have to conduct yourself with the, even the enemy as if they are human beings, because while well, they are, and each individual among them uh, is considered to be uh, as important as a world or a world in himself, as he would, would, would say in the, back in the Renaissance. Uh, the second thing that he uh, warns is that you have to be uh, careful in your calculations uh, when you consider, uh, as he puts it, the degree of justification in harming the many in order to save the one. So if if civilians are in, caught in the crossfire, um, uh, even uh, uh, even if your action is justified, you have to be sure that the amount of force that you use uh, is uh, is appropriate. You have to consider uh, proportionality in, in in his opinion. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was the chief uh, chief rabbi uh, of the British Empire uh, echoed echoed this as well, and he cites a couple of uh, midrashic commentaries. If you're not familiar. Uh, midrash is um, uh, the term used for a wide variety of Jewish commentaries, uh, ranging a long, long time span uh, in the classical era and, and going up into even into the uh, in, even into the Middle Ages. Um, and uh, they involve the explanation of verses uh, by looking essentially at a second layer of meaning. The verse may say something plainly, and the midrash will either try to fill in a gap or uh, or expound on the verse further. Um, there's a, a couple of midrashic commentaries which address uh, the wording that's used with respect to Abraham and Jacob, uh, both of whom uh, were afraid uh, when they encountered uh, an enemy. Abraham was afraid uh, in the context of, uh, of of an enemy that he had to fight. Abraham was a warrior; that was one of the one of his his qualities. He fights a war, uh, and Jacob. Uh, encounters his brother Esau, who wants to kill him. Uh, and in both cases, uh, they're afraid, and there are Midrashic texts, commentaries, that say that the reason that they're afraid is not simply for their own lives, uh, but in Abraham's case, he was afraid because he didn't want to accidentally kill the innocent. Uh, he was afraid that he might have committed a sin by by accidentally killing someone who who, who should not have been killed. Uh, in, in war, and Jacob was afraid lest he have to kill his brother, even though his brother was guilty and was trying to murder him. Uh, nevertheless, Jacob wanted to do everything that he could uh, to avoid uh, killing his uh, his brother, even in even in self defense. Um, this attitude, uh, which is characterized by ancient Jewish sources as, as calling the Jewish people merciful ones who are the children of merciful ones. Um, is an attitude uh, that I recognized in, in my grandfather, and it's an attitude that I recognize as a chaplain uh, in, in uh, with so many soldiers uh, whom, whom I've had the opportunity uh, to counsel, including uh, soldiers who dealt with terrible situations in combat. Um, and it's a it's a blessing uh, that I think we often take for granted uh, that uh, there is this Judeo Christian tradition uh, of taking extra care to ensure that uh, we remain merciful. Uh, in our personalities, that we don't lose our souls in war. Now, of course, uh, the first two speakers uh, spent a great deal of time correctly talking about how that attitude uh, can be misinterpreted or misconstrued in a way that prevents us from fighting wars justly uh, in order to uphold human dignity. And, and that's where I think it's very important to understand this ad the attitude that I've spoken about and where it comes from. Fundamentally, I think both Maimonides and Nachmanides, these, these two different medieval rabbis, they were both correct. Maimonides uh, is taking uh, is, is essentially noting uh, that when we practice uh, justice, uh, what we're doing is we're upholding human dignity. And so we have to ensure that we do that in every respect. That means not simply upholding human dignity when uh, we punish the enemy, but it also means ensuring that we punish the enemy. And Immanuel Kant uh, in in a in a in, in a piece that he he wrote about the death penalty, notes this. Uh, he says you can't you have to take full cognizance of dignity. Uh, it's not simply present when you try to spare the innocent or whether you try to uh, with you you try to prevent yourself from harming even the guilty unnecessarily, but it also has to be present when you consider that you must punish the guilty. You must uphold human dignity uh, by ensuring that justice is done. Uh, and I think the other two speakers did 
did a great deal of justice uh, talking about how how justice ought to be done and why it should not be prevented um, by misapplying um, the the, uh, the principles of just war and and also and 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 also the rule of the law of armed conflict, which stem from this attitude of mercy. Um, we need both mercy and justice, uh, and they have to function. Uh, they have to function well together. Um, thank you very, very much, Rabbi Rockland, uh, for your presentation and for bringing us to a uh, timely end of the lectures and the start of the Q&A. Um, and so the, we've gotten many, many good questions uh, in the Q&A box. And of course, if anybody wants to sneak in at this stage a little more, uh, we'll do our best to get in as many uh, as we can. However, the first part of the Q&A is really going to be, I hope, uh, just a few minutes of, of response and commentary between the speakers uh, themselves uh, to, to the presentations, the fine presentations that we've heard tonight. Um, and so perhaps I'd like to just open by asking uh, Captain Wheatley, uh, who's also written a little bit um, about the, the current uh, war that Israel's in, uh, a war of self-defense. Uh, I'd like to ask him to relate to... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hirsch's presentation, and then to get a little bit of a discussion started, and then several minutes in, we will turn to the questions. Thank you, Anna. Um, so thank you again to my fellow panelists. I really enjoyed listening to your remarks here. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to touch on in the presentation, but we ran out of time, um, was how uh, media covers uh, the, the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Um, and there's a lot that IHL, International Humanitarian Law, or LOAC, is a very nuanced, complicated area of law, and it's all—it's it, not—it's not served well by the fact that it, there's a ton of people who disagree on what even the basics are. Stuff, um, and so as you're reading coverage of a conflict like uh, like like Israel and Hamas, um, you'll notice there's different perspectives that come to the table. Um, and what newspapers choose to rely on, what sources they rely on greatly matter um, to how they how how a, a question is going to be answered in this in an article for you. So common common references that people people cite as reporters is the uh, uh, the ICRC, the Red Cross, that is. Um, there's there's other groups, uh, NGOs, Human Rights Watch, things of that sort. I, I guarantee if you Google articles about Israel and Hamas, these are going to be the chief like sort of experts that that, that media consult talk about these situations. Well I personally think you should be a little bit skeptical um, when the sole viewpoint offered in a newspaper article comes from organizations that, frankly, don't really have a whole lot of skin in the game. Certainly not nearly to the extent that that, that a country like Israel has, right, that's fighting for its existence. And on that point, I think it, it, it relates very much back to uh, uh, Colonel Hirsch's comments about kind of Israel's stakes in all of this. All of its proportionality analyses are being considered in the context of its strategic aims. It's fighting for its existence. And so while a certain attack might cause incidental harm to civilians, if the military advantage, uh, or excuse me, if feasible precautions have been taken, right, to protect civilians and the military advantage is considerable, um, it behooves Israel to take those actions, even if it doesn't play very well in some Western media outlets. It doesn't mean that a law has been violated. Um, I, I, I also want to say a couple of comments to um, uh, uh, Rabbi Rockland here. Uh, I, I especially appreciated your uh, um, don't lose your soul remark um, because it's easy, you know, especially after after the terrible events of something like October 7th, right, to 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 get to be filled with this sort of righteous anger and to avenge those people's deaths. And, and I think there's a certain amount of retributive justice that's been effectuated since then. Um, but fundamentally, good and evil exists, right? You know, you mentioned uh, vir Christian virtue ethics briefly. We're not going to go down this road too much, but there is a good, there is an evil, and as you are effectuating this sort of like posture of uh, this, this, this self defense um, mission, you can't ever lose sight of that. You are on the good side, right? Um, and so I, I, I talked about it briefly in my comments, but war is only waged. Um, if it's in pursuit of a more just peace, this this is this is the idea of use ad bellum. We didn't talk about it a lot today, um, but you can only wage war among other reasons if you are pursuing a more just peace. If if the way you wage war 
um, causes you to lose your soul, then you've essentially sacrificed the more just peace and you've just prolonged the evil. That's why it's critically important to observe these laws. Um, so thank you, Alana, for the comp for the opportunity to uh, respond. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Maurice or Rabbi Rockland to uh, contribute any comments they may have. Actually, uh, um, to, to respond, Captain Wheatley, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, I think that, uh, you know, Kant specifically, philosopher Immanuel Kant in his writing about the death penalty points out uh, that actually, uh, even though it seems like uh, killing uh, someone who is guilty and deserving of death uh, is an action uh, that, that might not be dignified, actually, it could be the most dignified thing that you could do in that situation. Because if that person has dignity, then he should know that he deserves to die. And if he's forfeited his dignity by becoming a, a cold-blooded killer, um, then he's essentially taken himself out uh, of, of society uh, and, needs, and needs to be killed. So the pursuit of the, of the more just peace um, is actually something that, that, that involves the pursuit of dignity. And that's something that I think people forget. They only think about dignity in the context um, of, uh, of avoiding unnecessary harm, but they, they sometimes forget that the pursuit of the more just peace is, is often more important. Um, and that's, of course, a calculation that has to be made with good conscience. But as you said, it's, it's a subjective consideration that has to be weighed honestly. I think that one issue that I've seen with a lot of soldiers is that is exactly what you, you identified, Captain Wheatley, which is that um, a lot of soldiers uh, think about killing in a very simple way. And, and the, the U.S. Army has actually done a lot of work on this and trying to educate uh, chaplains and soldiers about uh, different ways to, to think about this problem. Um, we, do, we are not the, the bad guys, so to speak, uh, simply because we, we kill. Um, there is often the assumption that killing is inherently wrong in all circumstances. Uh, and that it is only justifiable as the lesser evil of, of you know, other, uh, you know, it, it's a lesser evil than, than not killing. Um, but actually, the killing of the guilty, as Kant pointed out, is actually a good. That doesn't mean that it's something that we that we relish or, or that we we are we are happy about. Um, but it is not something that we should feel guilty about either. Um, and this is a major consideration that the VA has started to tackle uh, when it comes to the question of moral hazard and dealing with. Uh, the question of, of post-traumatic stress disorder as it as it arises in cases where people have had to kill um, have had to kill the enemy. Um, this actually has to be explained to people. And I think one factor that I'll, I'll conclude with, uh, it, which is so vitally important, um, is that in the 20th century, um, largely due to Disney and a variety of other um, a variety of other movements in when it came to publishing, nursery rhymes, fairy tales. Um, you saw a wholesale change um, in the, the stories that children were told. Uh, whereas fairy tales, nursery rhymes uh, used to feature evil, darkness, sad endings, bad endings, tragic tragedy, tragic results. Uh, instead, there's a movement to the happily ever after uh, genre. Um, works are sanitized. Um, references to evil are taken out. Um, and it actually has a terribly pernicious effect um, on children's ability to appreciate that evil exists in the world. Uh, and so what, what, what starts to happen is uh, an attitude that, well, you know, really um, killing is what's wrong. And so if I'm doing it, I'm the bad guy. And it, it leads to a very simple moral calculus, which is actually perverse and doesn't take into account the fact that there is good and there is evil um, and that the good should not be guilty about things that they have to do, even if those things are terrible uh, are, are, are terrible actions that we don't want to have to do. So, yeah, th thank you for, for, for your comments. Uh, I'm so, actually going to, I'm going to move to, um, just because we're starting to run short on time and I don't want um, a crowd of very engaged uh, people to feel like I didn't give them a voice. I'm going to start with a question. I'm going to start with you, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hirsch. What is uh, the assessment of the panelists about the IDF flooding of the Hamas tunnel system um, there have been uh, suggestions that uh, flooding the tunnels with salt water could uh, create sorts of harm to uh, freshwater aquifer, farming, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what was the assessment made in, in flooding the tunnels? And how does that sit uh, with, at the very least, Captain Wheatley, if not all three of the panelists as well? So, uh, so I'm sure that actually Captain Wheatley will, will probably be able to give not a, not a small answer on this as well. Um, one of the, I think one of the more learned articles 
that have been put out uh, uh, recently is actually from the Lieber School, uh, uh, from uh, the West Point School. Uh, um, and, and, and the answer is very simple. The, the, the idea of flooding has been used um, against enemies, has been used uh, uh, um, really for, 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 for hundreds of years. Um, and, and, and the question is here, what is, uh, um, what, what's the goal? Um, what's uh, uh, um, the intention? What is the, the, the incidental effect? Um, when you take into account that there is the, 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 these arguments that the, the, the water and the aquifer in Gaza, underneath Gaza, has already been ruined for many, many years. Uh, um, so now there are all types of ideas of, of adding in these, these additional uh, um, claims against Israel as if we're taking a sterile situation and now Israel is pumping in uh, uh, seawater uh, um, merely as a means of uh, 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 brutalizing uh, uh, the enemy. Uh, that, that, that's not the case. We're talking about an enemy that, 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 that's used humanitarian aid in order to dig these tunnels. Um, these tunnels are, 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 are an integral part of the terrorist infrastructure. Um, and similar to bunkers uh, um, that you have on, uh, on army bases, they are obviously uh, legitimate uh, targets. We also know, again, from uh, uh, the terrorists themselves, we had Musa Abu Marzouk, uh, um, one of the, the Hamas leaders um, responding to a question on, on, on Russian television. And, then, and so the interviewer asked him, well, you have these 500 plus kilometers of tunnels underneath the Gaza Strip. Why don't you let the civilians hide there? Why didn't you let them run away? And his answer was very, very simple. The tunnels are for us, for the Hamas, for the Fadayun, for the fighters. And uh, um, the civilians, well, they're, they're mostly refugees. They're the problem of the international community. So I think that's probably uh, um, the, 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 the easiest uh, uh, answer to give uh, on that subject. Um, these are military targets. The use of flooding is, is something which uh, has been taken to, into account and used previously uh, um, without a question. And uh, so it should be also for Asia. Captain Wheatley. Uh, there we go. I was on mute. So, um... I think the tunnel flooding question is, um, it pose, it, it's a great example of just how complicated the proportionality analysis can get. Um, I think the, one of the common uh, questions that we had here pointed out the danger to um, the fresh water supply in Gaza as a result of flooding the tunnels. Um, but, but the analysis is more complicated than just saying we have terrorists and tunnels and we've got fresh water supply that we need to maintain. Um, so an example of how this is more complicated, and, and there's an article on, on um, published on Articles of War uh, by Dr. R. Osari on this exact question, and he raises um, uh, he raises some of these complexities. One of them being, for example, um, proportionality only allows us, or rather, say, distinction only only allows us to um, engage or attack lawful military ob objects, right? So within a tunnel system, what is a military object, right? If if Hamas is using part of the tunnel uh, to 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 operate out of, um, does that make the entire tunnel system, um, even even where it may be miles away? I understand what three hundred miles of tunnel or something that that's been dug, um, or is it only that one part? Um, does it matter to the extent um, that Israel is able to uh, limit the flooding to just portions that Hamas uses? Um, the majority view is that um, if an object is being used by, such as an apartment building, for example, if an object is being used, um, even one floor of that is being used a as a base of military operations, the entire building becomes a target. Um, now, the building does, the perhaps the civilians occup are occupying the building do not, so that factors into a proportionality analysis. But um, that's just one example of how, how, how complicated this can get quickly. The same thing goes on the, on the fresh water supply side. Like, so part of this equation is um, to what extent will it be will it will it contaminate the water supply? Um, how long will it would it contaminate the water supply? Um, are there alternatives available that are less intrusive or or less destructive that Israel could avail itself? Um, and all of these are questions that are that are going to factor into a proportionality analysis um, when it comes flooding the tunnels. In terms of the military advantage on, on the other side, right? We've assessed the harms, the military advantage on the other side. Um, I think there's enormous um, military advantage in denying Hamas use of the of the tunnel systems. And um, uh, General 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 David Wallace and Shane Reeves, I recently wrote a, wrote a post about that as well. That 
drive the enemy into the surface would, would be to deprive it of its primary uh, advantage um, in this context. So that's kind of a roundabout way answer of saying, you know, I don't have a neat, I don't have a neat way to say yes or no on this, but those are some of the factors that are going to go into the analysis. Um, uh, Rabbi Rockman, do you have a comment or, or can I move on to no, the next it, 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 Only to say that this is the reason why U.S. military chaplains do not, we do not assist with with target selection at all. Um, we, we are, we, part of our job is to to point the way in terms of ethics in general, but this is left to command and, and Jack. The considerations are complex and chaplains are not combatants. We don't, we don't assist with target selection. Um, there's a higher uh, um, ethical uh, consideration that that always needs to be uh, in the background, um, but it's it's the lawyers and the commanders who are the ones making the decisions and applying them. Um, I'm going to move to a, a <clears throat> maybe a slightly more abstract question, but we received it in a few different versions in the Q and A. Uh, are we trying to fit a different type of conflict into an inadequate paradigm? Should we not only look to existing law of armed conflict in IHL, but how they may need to be updated to accommodate reality? And I would say, given the questions that we're talking both about the reality of the security threats, and perhaps given Rabbi Rockland's presentation, the reality of the culture. So with that, let's start with Captain Wheatley. So if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's asking, is it time for new, um, new rules surrounding the law of armed conflict. Um, and I saw there was a different question there in, in the chat about um, about how the US has been engaged in this sort of decades long asymmetric warfare against um, sub-state insurgent group, right? Um, I, I, the answer is, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it would be nice to have a, 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 a bright line set of rules that's always easy to apply, right? Like a speed limit sign. If you go faster than 55 miles per hour, you get a ticket. That's the law. That's the line. The problem is, is we're dealing in very human um, endeavors where there's n number of variables that that that's you know of which commanders aren't even totally aware of when they're operating. A classic case, you know, I I teach this stuff here at West Point, and a question my 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 cadets sometimes ask when we study the idea of, of engaging people who are directly participating in hostilities is. Okay, for how long is someone a, a, able to be attacked as a, as a military target, right? If you have a civilian um, who goes into his house and grabs a Kalashnikov and, and pops back out of the house and fires off a few shots at, a, at an army patrol and then goes back in the house and puts it away and goes back to being, you know, whatever he was before that, a farmer or, or some other job, Um how long is that person a, a, um, able to be attacked as a military target? And I, I would say that there's probably no no rule you can really craft, right? Some people have tried, um, but there's no real rule you can craft that's going to neatly capture all of those sort of idiosyncrasies and, and, and millions of variables that can change. So does it does IHL or LOAC need to be updated? Um, sure, I just don't know what the updates are that would be more effective than what we got. Um, all right, uh, Maurice, if you could uh, please relate to this uh, question. Yeah, uh, um, so so for those of you who uh, would have seen uh, the materials that I also sent uh, um, before the, the webinar, um, I, 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 I sent uh, um, through the, the article written by uh, uh, now Professor uh, Amir Khaikoyan um, on the subject and on the subject of of the need to update LOAC. Uh, uh, it needs to... When, when when the laws were basically written and understood, they took into account that you're talking about what I said in my uh, my opening remarks. You're talking about decent wars. You're talking about armies fighting armies. You're not talking about this whole idea of asymmetrical war um, where you have a non-state actor using and abusing the civilian population in order to carry out guerrilla-like uh, uh, activities. And and really the, 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 the rules that applied and have been adopted over the years aren't necessarily uh, sufficient in order to provide um, enough of a, a, um, enough of a solution for, I, I would say, for the regular army. Um, the, the terrorists don't care. Um, and it's the regular armies who would sometimes find themselves in a position of, of, of 
those, those, those armies that have respect for the law that find themselves questioning, well, can I do this or can I not because of the incidental damage um, instead of uh, uh, um, doing uh, uh, what's necessary. Uh, and I think, again, Captain Wheatley uh, uh, so, so, so rightly pointed to that question of, of, of DPH. And, and here you really have the tension of, although there is possibly a need to, to update the laws of war, you, you, you have these two diverging uh, uh, um, schools of thought at the moment. One school of thought saying, well, you need to provide more uh, flexibility for armies. The other school of thought pushing everything towards civilians and uh, uh, protecting civilians uh, 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 at, at all costs. Um, to, to, to note just uh, uh, by passing um, the, 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 the definition of the, of, the, of, the, of the International Red Cross, which says that a person is a direct participant in, in, in hostilities only at the point when he is actually involved in the activities. So in uh, uh, Captain Wheatley's uh, example, once he puts down the Kalachnikov, five minutes later, he's no longer a, 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 a DPH. But if he picks it up five minutes later, so he is again. And if he's not, and so what do you do with these people who are civilians by nature, but they're really combatants by day, by night? Um, that's the complexities that have to really be updated because otherwise you're going to find ourselves with, with people who are convicted despite the fact that they did their utmost um, to enforce the law. I have only one uh, anecdote from the army uh, that, that pertains to the people very rigidly going by the book uh, and not uh, addressing the situation at hand. I was in a uh, schoolhouse setting with a very large group of chaplains uh, and a, um, an instructor came, if I recall correctly, he was a JAG, he was a military lawyer, he was, he was not, a, not a chaplain, he was giving us a, a lesson on um, law of armed conflict and Geneva Convention, a variety of different things. And um, uh, he informed everyone in the room, you know, like lecturing that, and it was a PowerPoint presentation, I remember it well, that uh, if you are captured uh, by the enemy, uh, you will tell them that you're a chaplain and uh, you will be given special consideration and treatment under the Geneva Convention. You'll be allowed to minister to uh, fellow prisoners and you will be exchanged um, at, the, at the first possible time. You're only to give your name, rank, and uh, and service number, which at the time was your social security number. Uh, and um, someone raised his hand in the audience and asked, but I don't understand, we're fighting terrorists. Why are, like, why are you saying they're going to treat us well? And he just spat right back, like from the lecture, well, you are protected under the Geneva Conventions. And because you have a cross or in some, well, actually, almost everyone in the room was Christian. Um, uh, he says, because you have a cross on your uniform, they will see that and they will give you special consideration. And um, the uh, Southern Baptist guy sitting next to me turns to me and says, oh, yeah. And when they see your star, of David, they're going to give you extra special consideration. Uh, and uh, it, it, at, at that point, actually, another uh, student raised his hand and said, but, sir, uh, what if I don't want to give my Social Security number <laughs> away to the enemy? And the uh, lawyer <laughs> responded, well, I think if you wind up captured by Al Qaeda, you have more to worry about than identity theft. Um, but uh, I, I, I remember this story for for many years. I think that um, often we um, we fail to appreciate the enormity uh, of the problems that we're facing. I don't have the answers to it um, legally, but uh, I do think there's a problem that sometimes the standards that we we think we can apply are, are not easily um, uh, applicable. All right, we have um, about seven more minutes left, and then we're going to try to get uh, two questions in if we can. We've gotten a number of questions. I know this is something that Maurice touched on. A number of questions uh, relating to civilians in the current war, uh, or ostensible civilians in the current war uh, in Gaza, who have lent a helping hand um, to, uh, to Hamas or to PIJ or any number of other bad actors, unfortunately. And what is how how should they be looked at um, by the military and their considerations of of strikes? Uh, that would be, I think, the first good question uh, of, of the two. So could I turn to uh, Maurice this time to kick us off? So so uh, maybe just go back to the example that I gave in the talk in in, in my talk itself and my comments uh, ab about the definition of someone who just uses the app, a civilian who's using an app to uh, report on 
uh, um, uh, troop movements, that automatically, uh, um, according to uh, the analysis, actually turns you into a, a legitimate military target. And and so when you have someone, uh, again, IHL really distinguishes between three different categories. You're either a civilian and you enjoy complete uh, uh, um, uh, defense, or you're a soldier and you can be automatically attacked. Let's put aside the special categories of soldiers. Um, and then really that middle ground, that third category is a civilian who decides to participate in uh, uh, um, the war activities. And so when you're talking about terrorists, it's a much smaller jump as well. Um, so supporting Hamas, helping Hamas, obviously it has to be, has to be clear that it's, it's not incidental support. It's, it's supporting that military operations, really. Um, define what exactly is uh, um, that help is is, is, is always difficult. Um, if you see a, a Hamas fighter and, and, and he's limping and you, and you want to help him get to a, a, a park bench, uh, obviously the, the, there is that massive scale of, of what is that support and help, um, which would uh, um, implicate the, 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 the civilian as a DPH. Captain Wheatley, and then Rabbi Rockland, if you have something to add. Yeah, so, so touching on what Colonel Hurt said, it, it depends largely about what, what they're doing, right? So somebody who is uh, a civilian who's rendering aid to a wounded um, um, Hamas fighter um, would likely be viewed more in the nature of, of, a, of a medic or, 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 or a non-combatant under the Geneva Convention. Uh, but someone who is, for example, um, hiding Hamas fighters you know, or reporting on IDF troop movement and relaying it back to Hamas. Um, the, the, the U.S. policy is very clear on that. Um, those, those are direct participation in hostilities. Um, because the only thing that's required to engage is, is hostile act or hostile intent. Um, and if either of those two things are present, you have direct participation in hostilities and you can use bond. Um, so I, I won't, I won't belabor the point. I think Colonel Hirsch really, really touched on it quite well and that it, it really depends on what they're doing um, that turns on whether or not they could be a lawful military part. Well, in the interest of time, I've got nothing to add. Um, <clears throat> I, I'd like to uh, maybe try to go to the perspective of a soldier in the field, which uh, I know uh, you've been. I think all of you have been in one way or another. And I want to just continue this um, line of questioning. There, there was a sort of another question that dealt with, you know, the rules that govern the soldier on the battlefield, where the adversary is not wearing a uniform or abusing humanitarian symbols. But what's the experience of the soldier in the field? Can you just give us a little bit more of a perspective of what is going through, what is going through their brain when they're in combat? They've been trained, as as you said, uh, Maurice. Um, and uh, obviously, they have a, a a desire, you know, not to do excessive harm. But just so that people get more of a flavor of what that is, um, I truly appreciate it. And with that, I will turn it back to Maurice, then Cap, uh, then uh, Rabbi Rockland, and then Captain Wheatley. So I think uh, really the experience of the of, of the soldier in the field has to be divided between the different levels of activities, um, ground operations. Um, has to be seen separately from area operations, specifically those in which you have pre, uh, uh, predetermined targets, and uh, uh, um, and you have that ability with the obviously it's it, it sometimes it's split uh, uh, second decisions, but you have that ability to make and and adjust uh, um, the course of action um, on the ground. I think the feeling of the soldiers is uh, uh, is predominantly one of tremendous fear not only of the enemy but also of of, of of the of the legal implications of 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 their actions I think this is something which is so much more uh, um on uh, um on on the radar of of, of, of the Israeli soldiers uh, um after being constantly accused of being uh, war criminals so they really do they really are minded to that and I think that they do try uh, um as best possible to, to take all of the precautions necessary. Um, I, I, I'd go back to what Rabbi uh, Rochlin said uh, uh, um, and, and, and what I've said uh, um, on numerous occasions uh, to soldiers um, before whom I've uh, given lectures. The idea is to go into war, to kill the enemy, but to keep your soul. 
These rules aren't there for the enemy. They aren't there for their civilians. They're there, none, no less, for us to come out human on the other side. And, and, and therefore, that's the standard we require of you. And, and you should do everything to, to really live up to that uh, um, not insignificant standard. This is a oh, very, oh, yeah, this is a very complex issue, of course. In the interest of time, I'm going to try to just address one thing that I've noticed, which I mentioned earlier. Um, there is a common fear that I've seen uh, in the United States military um, uh, uh, very often um, of, of the, sol the soldier feeling, uh, fearing killing uh, the enemy and also uh, feeling guilty uh, that he's done so. Uh, I'm not talking about situations in which uh, a soldier inadvertently harmed an innocent. Or, uh, I'm, I'm not referring to that. I'm talking about even situations in which uh, the soldier has legit has killed a combatant legitimately and legally um, uh, with with all justification. Um, there there is a common attitude that what that what he did is nevertheless something that he should feel guilty for. Uh, and, um, and, and, and essentially was a sin, uh, that was, may have been justified as the lesser evil in the situation, but, uh, is nevertheless a sin that he should feel guilty for. Uh, this is obviously a very complicated, um, uh, matter, but I, I think it's just not a good attitude to have. And, um, and I think that it, one of the sources for this is the, the elimination, uh, of the model of the good shepherd. Uh, in our society uh, and in our education. Uh, it, it, it's present from early education with sanitized nursery rhymes, fairy tales, stories, movies, um, in which kill the, the killing is minimized. And people don't have heroes to look up to uh, who kill in a responsible and justified manner in order to face cruel evil. Um, it's one thing to feel, uh, uh, to feel afraid uh, of killing because it's something we want to stay away from. It's another thing to feel guilty about it, to feel that you've actually sinned. And I, I think that um, we can come to terms with that. The army has done some some good work on this. Uh, if we if we focus on the shepherd analogy uh, uh, when it comes to killing, um, even though uh, we don't want to do it, it's not something that should rack us as a sin that we should feel eternally uh, guilty for. If if we if we're, we're killing in for good against evil. All right, we have one final question that's unfortunately a complex one, as most of them have been. And this relates to the question of the hostages that Hamas has taken. Um, and uh, it's sort of a two-prong thing. Does that in any way change the calculus uh, in terms of Hamas targeting on the side of the IDF and the, the desire not to harm the hostages, but also in that violation, as they have uh, violated so many other uh, norms of international law, um, does that also allow for any additional um, leeway or a lowering of constraints in uh, operations meant to save them, meant to save the hostages? We'll start with uh, Maurice, and then we'll go to Captain Wheatley. And then uh, within two or three minutes, Rabbi Coleman is going to sign off and go over the CLE procedures again. So uh, um, the subject of the hostages is something which is very, very, very sensitive, obviously, for Israel. Uh, um, we saw the incident just a few days ago of, of hostages being killed by friendly fire. Um, it's the result of Hamas, uh, um, again, using every uh, uh, ruse possible just uh, uh, um, days before. Um, there were two incidents uh, uh, already reported of Hamas terrorists coming out. You, uh, um, many, many of the terrorists speak Hebrew. Uh, they're not just speaking uh, Arabic, um, waving white flags and then attacking the forces. Um, it is a, a tremendously complex. Um, if anything, for Israel, it has uh, um, not allowed us or, or urged us or, or, or pushed us to taking more extreme measures, but rather the opposite. It has deterred us from taking a, a, a much more forceful measures, which could potentially have been uh, uh, justified because of the fear of uh, um, killing the, uh, the, the, the hostages and, and never then being able to find them. Um, that's a situation which uh, uh, we don't want to find ourselves in. We don't want to find Israeli uh, families in that situation, um, such as the Golden family who have been uh, waiting, uh, 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 and the Oron family have been uh, uh, waiting for so long for, for the return of their, of, of, of their sons. Uh, um, so, so that's something which 
uh, uh, paradoxically, is is imposing upon Israel more limitations rather than more flexibility and more uh, 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 aggression. Um, I'll uh, adding to that. I, I I think the hostage the hostage question is is primarily how to how to address it is really a primarily a political policy question. Um, and to, I don't necessarily think that prosecuting the war against Hamas and ensuring the hostages can come home safely are two goals that are necessarily at odds with each other. But to the extent that they that that, that perhaps they do affect each other, that that's an assessment policy leaders or decision makers are going to have to weigh. From a legal standpoint, hostages are treated like civilians um, under LOAC, um, and to the extent that Hamas is putting civilians in harm's way using human shields from a and we know that they do that um gratuitously um is that that affects the proportionality analysis in that that actually cuts in israel's favor right it's 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 it, you can't right the, imagine the perverse incentive that that would be created if you know if, if a terrorist organization could kidnap someone use them as a human shield and then also secure be, be secure against armed attack by their adversaries um so harm that falls to the hostages just like any civilian is is harm that's going to be or, or blood that's going to be on hamas's hands not on israel's hands it doesn't create an additional legal obligation on israel's part beyond what uh, proportionality already requires mm -hmm.